Welcome to Ben Church. I am Senior Pastor Jen Stewart, and we are so thankful that you are joining us in this online space to worship. We here at Ben Church believe that every human being is a beloved child of God. And wherever you are on your journey in faith, you're more than welcome. You are affirmed and loved here at Ben Church. This is the last Sunday in March as we are moving through Lent. And each week of this Lenten season, we have been focusing on ways that we can practice a countercultural theology that emphasizes the beauty and grace of the reality of life that is right before us. Um, rather than waiting with increasing judgment to reach some vision of a perfected existence. Our ladder climbing efforts sometimes end up taking us down a rung or two as things don't work out just right. And so let us continue to turn ladders into gardens, nurturing our souls and embracing our holy, good enough lives. Welcome. Let us pray together. Holy One, God of forgiveness, we call out to you, and you surround us with deliverance. You love us infinitely more than we love ourselves or others. Open us this day to your counsel, helping us be more merciful, more grace-filled, so that we might rejoice in simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, we are offered some opportunities for repentance and confession. In this series, we're actually calling it Honest Questions, Compassionate Response. Today, we will hear how the prodigal son lives high on the hog and then famine strikes in the land of his dream vacation. And so he heads home, tail between his legs, expecting that he has lost it all. To his surprise, his extravagant failure is met with extravagant love and grace. We can be pretty hard on ourselves when things don't go as planned. Guilt, shame, and fear of being seen as a failure can leave us wallowing in the pig pen. Our delusions of a perfectible life keep us disappointed in ourselves. Truth is, life is a big old risk every single day. And facing whatever each day holds is not only good enough, but worthy of love and grace. Do you find yourself being unrealistically hard on yourself? Let us take a moment of silent reflection. And now hear this compassionate word 
from the second letter to the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Know that already God is offering us freedom from the guilt and shame of our past failings and our present unrealistic expectations. We are invited to rejoice that each day is a new beginning so that we might enjoy and not dread the life before us. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven, even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, 11b through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. All right, well, today we're going to talk about grace and judgment. Are you up for it? Who needs some grace today? All right, all right. Who needs some judgment? Less takers, weird. All right, well, um, also hello to our online people. Y'all say hello to the online people. <laughs> You're still here. There's still a lot of people at home not feeling quite safe to be here. All right, well, <clears throat> the Bible teaches us that everything we have from God is given uh, because of God's great love for us. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith, Ephesians 2 reads. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Thanks be to God. Amen. We love our grace. Love it, love it, love it. We don't love judgment. And if I am honest, which I try to be, the most judgment that I have is for blamers. Do you know, you know blamers? Well, I'm going to tell you, for nine years, I worked at the tax trailer. Tax trailer because we did taxes and worked out of an Airstream trailer. See what we did there? Tax trailer. Uh, it was really fun. It was a very supportive work environment. We did a lot of fun work. The accountants and bookkeepers, I should note, I was not an accountant or a bookkeeper. I was a person up front being nice to everyone while the accountants and the bookkeepers were in the back being judgmental about everyone. I'm just, I'm not saying that's true for all accountants and bookkeepers, but anyway, the accountants and bookkeepers were uh, very supportive of our clients, honestly. It was a great place to work, <clears throat> except when someone showed us that they were a blamer. And you know blamers, blamers blame, right? Everyone but themselves. And there is always a reason for whatever bad thing has happened to them and it is never their fault, ever. Which, you know, there may be some places where that will work, but a tax place is not one of those places, right? And here was the fun part about working at the tax trailer. If people got too blamey, we'd fire them. We'd fire a client. Because you can't fix a tax situation for a person who refuses to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, blamers gotta blame, and this is just absolute truth, my friends. Blaming is utterly human, completely useless, and extremely obnoxious, am I right? Well, the first blamers in our scriptures are right at the beginning. It's the second story in the Bible, and it's a story about our orientation to God, to, to life. How do we think about our connection to God? And it's the story of Adam and Eve. Now, as Christ followers, again, we believe that everything comes to us as a gift, but we humans, we know, are apt to fear and distrust this idea. And this is the root cause of sin. Sin being a turning away from God. So in that story, Adam and Eve are in the garden when, obviously, a talking snake slithers by and says to Eve, did God say you shall eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve says to the serpent, no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. And the snake says to the woman, 
you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And then the snake slithers away. And Eve ponders this thought. What would it be like to be like God? I would not have to worry about taking care of myself. I could create whatever I wanted. I would be secure. I would be all powerful. And so Eve and Adam partake of the fruit in their fear and distrust that what they already have is not enough. Creating a separation from God that we in the church call sin. They were the first blamers. She blames the snake, he blames her, and the church has used this mythical story to mistrust women since its inception. And why do we know this is a mythical story? There is a talking snake, my friends. Mythical stories concern the early history of a people usually explaining some natural or social phenomenon and typically involving supernatural beings or events or talking snakes. So sin is not a list of things we should not do, but instead uh, think of it as a syndrome that causes us to be unwilling to trust God and each other, to always seek for something outside of ourselves to fill us up and to blame others when we feel inadequate. Does that sound agreeable? Maybe not agreeable, but true. And this is why Christians look to Jesus. Not because God is always angry with us, but because we are continually looking for that apple to fill us up when we already have everything we need. We need to be saved from ourselves. And we need a savior who is filled with grace. And the picture of why we need grace is best articulated in the story that Larry read for us today, the prodigal son, or more positively, the loving father. In this story, as we heard, the uh, ungrateful young son demands his inheritance early. Dad, give me all my money. I deserve it. And his father just does it, gives him everything that he asks for. And the young son spends it. We don't know exactly what he spends it on. Dissolute living, right? Wine, women, and song. Who knows what he spent it on? But he has a really fantastic time. That is clear until the famine comes and he runs out of money. <clears throat> and then he finds himself deeply depressed and living in abject poverty. Now, we also know from Scripture, <clears throat> from that great book, Leviticus, that pigs were considered unclean, so unclean you can't even eat them. And for a Jewish boy to find himself slopping hogs in order to survive was about the lowest he could get. So he decides he's had enough, and he's just going to go home and beg his father for forgiveness. And you know... <laughs> You've had that moment in your life when you've done something you really need to repent for and you need to come up to that person and just say it. How difficult this is, the courage it takes to ramp yourself up and just say, I was wrong. I am sorry. So he gets up and decides he's going to take responsibility for his actions and beg his father to take him back. And as he is walking up the drive, there is his father looking out, waiting for him. And when his father sees him, he, he, he runs up the road to meet him and greets him with open arms. And he throws his son a party and welcomes him back home. Kill the fatted calf. My child is home. And this is the picture of divine grace. And of course, the older son is enraged <laughs> that his father would welcome his little brother back home so easily, not even, hey, uh, you know, you did this really bad thing. No, no. Enraged, 
And he says to his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. You, you have never even given me a young goat to have a party with with my friends. And then this son of yours, not my brother, notice, this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You didn't know he had prostitutes, but you know, he's, he's making an assumption here. And you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father, of course, we know, says to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Hallelujah. A profound truth. There is a condition worse than death to be lost. And there is a condition better than life to be found and known and claimed. This is the story that Jesus tells. That's where it ends. And Jesus is always inviting us to think through the meaning of these parables for ourselves. I think it's interesting that we always call it the prodigal son and not the loving father. What does that say about us? And this story illustrates in the younger son that there is no sin so bad that God will not forgive us. And in the older son, there are no deeds we can do that will obligate God to love us more. God already loves us. And so we can break free from the worry of works righteousness. And I love this story. I absolutely adore it. And honestly, I've never gotten to preach on it before. So <laughs> sorry, y'all, this is going on, but you know. I love this story, I think, because I, I have seen myself, every time I've heard it preached, in different parts of the story. You know? Um, the parent who loves both children, despite how different they are from each other. And the love flows out with joy when a child recognizes their responsibilities and repents. As a parent, I can feel that. I remember those moments. It's a gift, right? And then there's the younger son making bad decisions and needing forgiveness. Been there. And then there's the older son, angry and bitter that all the good he's done did not make him more lovable in the eyes of his father. Blaming his father for his own unhappiness. Unable to see that he was invited to the party too. He just had to show up and have fun. I've been that person too. I think we need Jesus to tell us these stories as they invite us to look at ourselves, at our hearts, you know, at where, at how we're seeing the world. And see when we are rejecting grace for ourselves and for others. Because it happens all the time. We need Jesus whose life, death, and resurrection best shows us what grace looks like. And the picture of the cross is the picture of God on the cross. We do this to each other with our harsh judgments and violence. Not God. So in this parable of the loving father, we see a vision for how we might offer grace to ourselves and to the world. We don't have to always sit in judgment blaming others for the way that they've made us feel. We don't have to live in guilt, shame, and fear of being seen as a failure, especially when our economy is bad and our middle class dreams seem to be far off. I can leave us wallowing in the pig pen and wasting our lives because we're too ashamed to ask for help. So here's my thought. Wouldn't it have been a much better party if the older brother got out there dancing with his little brother? In my version of the ending of this story, which we don't get, Jesus doesn't get it, so I can make up my own version, as can you. In my version of this story, I would have the older son say, you know what, Dad, 
you're right. You've always loved me. You've always been there for me. I've never wanted for anything. Let's go dance. And then he and his brother would still argue from time to time. But because their father had been so generous to them, they start a nonprofit, making sure that no one else has to live in a pigsty, even if they make bad decisions. And they'd be known as the Love Brothers. Love Brothers nonprofit. And, and they would finally understand the power of belief and how actually believing that you were beloved and that you mattered and that God loved you could change the way that you see the world. And if you change the way that you see the world, it changes the way you interact with reality. And instead of the younger brother wallowing in shame and the older brother simmering with anger, they put their grace to use. And because of the Love Brothers, no one was ever homeless in their town ever again. And they stu stuck up for their brothers and sisters and siblings on the street and worked for a just system that didn't allow anyone to be barred from a decent place to live. That's how I end this story. What about you? Jesus gives us the prompt. He starts the story. How are we going to end it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. I invite you to receive this blessing. Hands out if you are willing. Blessed are you who do not despise yourselves. It may hurt sometimes. You may not recognize yourself in the mirror, but this is what we hoped for, right? To live and to love and to be loved. Blessed are you who offer grace because you know how much of it you have received. Amen. For those of us who are still worshiping in this online way, we want you to know that we believe that God's spirit connects us all. And one of the ways that we remember that connection is practicing rituals or saying certain words or prayers that resonate through the ages and that connect us to our tradition. One of those prayers is the Lord's Prayer. In person here in the sanctuary, we say it each week together. And so I invite you now to share in the Lord's Prayer with me. The words for you to say will appear on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Oh, thank you so much for your continued giving to Ben Church. We are so grateful. We are moving forward into our spring, into Easter, with great hope for this, this year and all that it will bring. If you would like to continue to give to the church, you can do so in one of two ways. We have our e-offering, which is available through our website. It's called e-offering, it's online giving. The other is to send a check to our mailbox here at the church. We also are excited to announce that we will be um, having a Venmo account, which for those of you who use Venmo, you'll know how easy and quick it is to pay. And so more information about that account will be coming out soon. Now let us pray and bless the gifts that will be given this week. Generous God, in light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of our world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the produce of love. Amen. Receive this benediction, my friends. May the God who loves all of creation, especially the broken bits, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit, who loves to improvise and surprising ways go with you, dwell among you, and bring you joy. Go in peace. Amen.